Right. So today we are going to start. This is the only organ that is going to incorporate the anorganic iodine into the organic bindings. You know that this gland is about 30 gram, 35 gram in weight and is located in the front of the neck and they have three lobes, you know, that the left, right and the left and the middle one. And uh, when you go and when you palpate, you relatively you are going to determine the size. And of course, if you do have any kind of enlargement, you can see that the goiter is presented. However, not only, let's see, the size is only one thing that can give a sign of any kind of thyroid dysfunction, but for example, swallowing disturbance or changes of the voice. That can be another characteristic features. Now, let's see how this iodine transport works in these epithelial cells. First of all, you know very well that this kind of structure of the thyroid gland as a follicular structure is very important because inside the follicles that is surrounded by epithelial cells, we do have the thyroglobulin. This thyroglobulin never met with the immune system. So any kind of damage of the thyroid gland, the epithelial cells, the consequence be an autoimmune phenomenon, autoimmune progressive diseases. Very similarly to the lens and the testicles, this is how it's going to be. Now, first of all, we do have this iodine transport system on the surface of the epithelial cells, and after this iodine, this uh, ionized iodine is pushed into this uh, internal, this colloid structure. And here the enzyme is going to oxidate and going to, uh, going to oxidase and making this peroxidase reaction, the iodination of the tyrosine ring. And we do have a lot of iodinated tyrosine ring in this tyroglobulin. And depending on the need, this kind of tyroglobulin is going to be, first of all, excreted by endocytosis. And as you see here, the conjugase enzyme is conjugating the iodinated tyrosine rings. And this is how it's going to be released out with the monocarboxylate transport system. And mostly we are going to have the tyroxine and a little amount of tyroidone, so T3 is going to be released into the circulation. If you compare, let's say, the volume or the level of the T4, of course it's much more comparing to the T3. Now, uh, talking about the regulation, in case of the thyroid gland, this feedback regulation is very strict, very precisely set up. So any kind of changes of the biological active free T4 level, the pituitary is feedbacking and the hypothalamus feedback as well. Now, uh, you know that after when the T, uh, T4 and T3 is released, in the periphery we do have some deiodinases that is going to convert T4 to the T3 and that's be the more active form. But generally talking, the feedbacking hormone, mostly the T4. So this is why the TSH and the T4 is very well correlated negatively to each other. Now, uh, when we do have this deiodinase enzyme in the periphery, there are two possible processes that can go. First of all, we can have, it's called a step up deiodination. When we do remove the iodine from the outer ring of the tyroxine, and this makes a more potent T3, that's about 500 times more potent than the T4. And we could have another one, but however, this called the reverse T3 is ineffective, completely ineffective. As you can see, that is less than 1% of the original effect of the T4. Now, this kind of deiodinase is located in different organs. So this is another possibility how you can regulate the thyroid function. First of all, in the liver, we have the type 1, when it's making the active one, and in the pituitary, placenta, and brain. These are res uh, relatively hard the basal metabolic rate, how the basal, let's see, metabolisms are going to be influenced by the thyroid hormone levels. Another important one, as you look at here, the total T4 is distributed and bound different protein. The highest volume of this binding is taking place by the uh, thyroid binding globulin and takes about 70% of the total T4. And that 
uh, thyroid binding pre-albumin, another one, albumin, of course, uh, as specifically is going to bind uh, uh, thyroxine as well. And only the active form, there's a free form, it's a teeny tiny amount. It takes about 0.04% of the total T4. So the circulating T4, it's only a fraction is in the free form only. So the effective form is very teeny tiny. Now that was a very difficult to measure it in the lab. Because as you see here, how many times Jesus Christ is about magnitude, order of magnitude is much higher than the total T4. So to measure this free form, it wasn't an easy one. Today, however, it's no problem. You can ask it immediately, but it takes decades when they figured out the, let's see, the tools or the clinical uh, diagnostic tools when you can apply immediately and you don't need to have some free T4 index and, and raisin uptakes and other. They, somehow they wanted to figure out, maybe in the literature if you are reading something, so this is an ancient, maybe the last century has happened, so, but you don't need to do it. You can order the free form. Another very important one, look at the half-life of these hormones. The T4 has about one week. What does it mean? If anybody had any kind of hyperthyroidism, anybody had an increased T4 level, when you start to treat the patient, it will respond more than one week. So it won't affect immediately the situation. So you have to wait one or two weeks when you can see any kind of progress in the disappearance of the clinical sign of hyperthyroidism. In a T4, it's much faster, about one day. So the T3, I mean, T3 level, it uh, decreases much uh, faster, but because the major, let's see, the precursor of the T3 is T4, this is why the clinical symptoms very gradually and very slowly disappears from the patient. Now, what are, let's summarize a little bit, or let's revise what you learn in uh, physiology. What are the actions of the TSH on the thyroid gland? First of all, it's going to stimulate the iodine uptake. Plus, it's going to induce the hormone synthesis by the gland, and the release of the preformed hormone is going to be potentiated through the cyclic EMP mechanism. And other very important one it, that has a clinical reason. So the thyroid gland size and the vascularization is going to be increased. So what does it mean? If you do have any kind of process that you do have an increased TSH effect, it doesn't mean that directly the TSH has to be because you already heard about it. In Gray's basal disease, we do have an immune globulin that is going to activate the receptor. So what will be a consequence? Not only to synthesize more hormone, but the vascularization of the gland is going to increase. So if you want to treat the patient, if you want to operate the patient, first of all, you have to, let's see, regress the vascularization. You have to somehow decrease the vascularization of the gland because when they cut it, it's bleed out of hell and the patient can die due to the surgery you mentioned. So this is why the pretreatment is needed before they are going to perform any kind of surgery. Now, the action of the thyroid gland generally uh, affects the intermediary metabolism and um, has particular effect on a specific organ system, such as, for example, the development, and we shall talk about later, neurological, so the, the central nervous system, the skeletal muscle system development is depending on the thyroid hormones. Uh, basal metabolic rate, the oxygen consumption, for example, usually is going to regulate the mitochondrial activity, so we are going to produce more ATP, we are using up more energy, so burning, let's see, more fuel. This is how you can lose weight easily, taking a pill, and you are burning because your basal metabolic rate is going to increase, and you will have some other side effect, of course, but something for something. Sympathetic effect, similar to those in the catecholamides, and uh, we have another hormone uh, milieu, for example, the uh, glucocorticoids has very similar effect as the thyroxine has. Pulmonary effect, through the musculature, through the diffusion, through the uh, drive for breathing. So usually who has a low level, they do have some respiratory problem as well in this patient. Hematopoiesis, anemia is very frequent finding if you don't have enough, for example, thyroid hormone level. Endocrine system is affected, is going to alter the cortisol metabolism and clearance, and 
is going to increase the turnover of the bone and is the, the normal reproductive function is going to depend on the tyroxine. So the drive that you have to, let's see, do if you want to uh, mate or multiply, it needs some tyroxine hormone as well. Now, talking about the distribution or the spectrum of these thyroid diseases is not only three different situations we have. So we have a normal function, that's called the urothyroid function, of course, and not only the hypothyroid and the hyperthyroid situation we do have, but as you see here, we do have that's called subclinical hypothyroidism or subclinical hyperthyroidism. Uh, this is not spelled normally. Now, what does it mean? First of all, as you learn in the practice, we are always asking together the free hormone and the trope hormone levels. So, meaning in primary or secondary, you can make the differences. The most common cause, usually in almost in every disease, is the primary problem. Now, if we do have a normal situation, the TSH range is about 0.3 to 4.2, and because the regulation, the feedback regulation is very sensitive, so it will sense the biological active hormone very uh, precisely, we can distinguish, it's called a subclinical form. As you see here, if you do have a primary hypothyroidism, meaning that you do have a normal T4 level, so in the serum we do have a normal level of the free T4, however, because that T4 is not enough to feed back normally the TSH, the TSH already started to increase. So the patient presented with a normal target hormone level, however, the pituitary trope hormone level already increased. So the patient usually does not show the typical sign of hyperthyroidism, but the patient is on the way to develop a complete and relatively uh, progress hypothyroidism when we do have an increased TSH and a low T4 level. The opposite is going to happen in the subclinical primary hypothyroidism when we do have a normal target hormone levels in a normal range, but the TSH already suppressed, meaning that this hormone already enough to feed back the pituitary. This is why the gland is going to suppress the secretion of the TSH. And of course, later on, the patient is going to be a completely manifested hyperthyroidic patient. Now, let's see a case report and we shall understand, let's see what kind of clinical symptoms we are going to have when we do have first hypothyroidism. This is a 40-year-old woman presents to her general practitioner with fatigue. She has felt sluggish uh, for months and thinks she may be anemic. She started taking iron and vitamin tablets pills two months ago, but reports not feeling any better. Although she was diagnosed with mild postnatal depression after the birth of her uh, second child, three years ago she states she is not depressed and that she has been sleeping well. On questioning, she has noticed some thinning of her hair and feels as if her skin is dry. She is a non-smoker, occasionally drinks alcohol and doesn't exercise. Her hair is thinned, but there are no focal patches of alopecia, uh, alopecia or scarring of the scalp. Physical examination, her skin is diffusely dry, her thyroid gland feels diffusely enlarged, is non-tender, and has no nodules. Very important when you evaluate the thyroid gland, you have to look or ask for any kind of sensitivity because sensitivity usually means some kind of inflammation, mostly acute or subacute inflammation. Okay, look at the blood pressure, it's normal. Pause, it's in a normal. Uh, temperature, it's normal. So everything looks like normal, maybe a temperature a little bit lower, it's not 36.5, but Everybody can have it. Okay, lab measurement. Everything is normal. Maybe the hemoglobin a little bit on the lower edge, but other tests that they measure, the tyroxine, the free T4 is lower than normal, and the TSH already increased. So this looks like as a primary hypothyroidism. This patient, the uh, cyclical science and everything, is a primary hypothyroidism. 
Good. Let's go on. Now, what can be the clinical sign of a hypothyroidism? Depending on the age, in infant, because thyroid hormone has an important role to regulate the growth and the neural development, this is why this hormone, so thyroid function, is checked right after delivery to avoid the development of cretinism, because that cretinism is irreversible. However, if you start treating the patient right after delivery, this won't happen, and the substitution should be continued forever. And uh, what will happen if somebody develops it? And today's now it's very rare because if somebody born with a normal environment, they have to check this kind of uh, enzyme. Mark slowly growth and developmental and mental retardation. This is why the cretinism, that's how it's called. Let's see what will happen in general, talking in adult one. The hypothyroidism is the most common endocrine disorders. If you see in a population, the range is around 4 to 5 percent, so relatively is very high, and especially in elderly one is more common one. And of course, women are more affected than men, and the incidence is rising. And the incidence, as we shall see, that the cause of hypothyroidism is changing. Let's see what can be the symptoms of sign of hypothyroidism. Some patient is going to present the all, some patient does not, some patient has some a specific one, but when you see that, for example, the cardiovascular situation, bradycardy, for example, reduced cardiac output, this is why hypotension can develop, low voltage, when you look at the ECG, the R's are smaller ones, it's low voltage, very characteristic one, decreased GFR, some kind of kidney function is affected, and anemia, so the patient usually presented as an anemic patient. Gastrointestine, weight gain, and constipation can be the leading symptoms of a patient who has hypothyroidism. On the skin, of course, we do have, for example, you learn that, this myxedema, the propylene glycine level is increases and swallowing up, that, but generally, subcutaneously, we do have this myxedema changes. So it looks like puffiness of the skin. Hair loss, dry skin, carotenoderma. Now what does it mean carotenoderma? Carotenoderma means that the carotene, uh, let's see, it accumulates in the skin and the skin be yellowish. This is due to not only eating more carrots because you can have this one if you eat too much carrot or too much oranges or, too, uh, or I don't know what kind of carotene containing substance you can eat it. And we do have an enzyme that is going to convert the carotene to retinol. However, if we have low level of the thyroxine, this enzyme is inhibited, so the activity is less. This is why the skin be more uh, yellowish, so containing more carotene. Neurological symptoms, tiredness, depression, psychosis, memory loss. So the clinical symptoms sometimes be very, very similar to a depression. So this is why a lot of patients is treated by a psychiatrist, because they feel that they, they don't have other typical side. But if you take the psychiatric courses, they will see that the thyroid function should be checked. This is why the thyroid hormone level is included in the general checkup. Uh, this is how it looks like. You look at the puffiness, the tongue, and the face is apathic face. This uh, myxedema, generally not only in the legs, but everywhere. This is a carotenoderma. This is a yellowish skin. Vitiligo can be when you do have some whitish uh, skin areas of the patient. So this is how it occurs from outside. Now let's see what are the common causes, and especially the primary common causes of hypothyroidism. Today's the most common cause is the Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's a chronic autoimmune disorders. Long time ago, this is, wasn't the most common one, especially in Hungary about 50 or 60 years ago, the iodine deficiency was a very common cause. But today's the autoimmune disorders. And this is how the, let's see, the incidence of the autoimmune diseases increases today's. Following treatment of hyperthyroidism, or somebody, for example, when they're removing the gland, they're removing a little more, 
two-third thyroidectomy that usually perform in graves vessel diseases. Or they are using, for example, uh, radioactive iodine to destroy a certain amount of thyroid gland in case of the hyperthyroidism. That, if you overshoot, basically the patient can develop hypothyroidism. Uh, there is another one, is a subacute or silent hypoditis. Usually, there's a viral infection, which I'll talk about later. Iodine deficiency, I mentioned it. But not only iodine deficiency, but excess of the iodine can cause hypothyroidism. So, for example, if you overdose your system with iodine, for example, if somebody lives on the seashore and eats a lot of calves and anything that comes out from the sea, they can inhibit the further iodine uptake and inhibit the release of the thyroid hormone. So that can be presented as a hypothyroidism. Very rarely congenital problem. And you have to think about some drugs, for example, lithium or amiodarone. This can cause hypothyroidism, can cause the depression of the thyroid gland function. Now let's continue with our case study. And as you see here, the hypothyroidism, okay, how can we judge whether that's, a, for example, an autoimmune or not? We do have, and you are going to learn it or you already heard during the seminars, there are several antibodies that can be checked. We can check, let's see, the TSH receptor stimulatory antibody or thyroid antibody, such as a TRAB, that's usually associated with graves vessel of diseases. You can check the thyroperoxidase antibody, the enzyme that is needed for the normal synthesis of the thyroid gland, thyroid hormone. Or you can check the antithyroglobulin antibody. These are the antibodies. You can check the thyroglobulin as well. Mostly the thyroglobulin is associated with the disruption of the follicular structure, in metastasis or any kind of, let's see, uh, damage or inflammatory, acute inflammatory damage of the thyroid gland that can cause it. Now, as they measure what they found, anti-thyroglobulin antibody and the anti-pyroxidase antibody was positive in the lab, so this possibly is a Hashimoto thyroiditis, and you have to substitute the patient with the thyroid hormone, and you cannot do anything because this is going to continue and uh, going to affect the thyroid gland and destroy the thyroid gland. Now, uh, what is the Hashimoto thyroiditis? The Hashimoto thyroiditis is a chronic autoimmune thyroiditis, and this inflammatory uh, process is going to destroy the gland. This Hashimoto thyroiditis, they have three different phases. Sometimes these three different phases uh, don't manifest it very fully. At the beginning, some patient presented as a hyperthyroidism. So when you have a destruction and the thyroglobulin gets out and a lot of hormone gets into the circulation. In the middle, when you're destroying certain amount of, let's say, gland, you, the patient has a normal functioning. And by the end, the patient has the final phase, that's the hypothyroidic phase. And that's usually ended by is a completely fibrotically transfer uh, gland. Now, uh, another very important one, and maybe you recall in the seminars when we had in a diabetes mellitus, in type 1, they are always checking the presence of these thyroid antibodies. Because type 1 diabetic patient very frequently develops Hashimoto thyroiditis as well in the future. This is why every year they have to check the tidal function very precisely. All right? And mostly the elderly one, this Hashimoto, is increases now to this. Okay, what could be the pathomechanism of this one? Any kind of trigger mechanism. That include, for example, estrogen pill therapy, or somebody taking lithium therapy, or inflammation, or uh, ah, pregnancy, cytokine therapy, that's going to alter the regulation of the immune system. And mostly the lymphocyte, and relatively the uh, cytotoxic lymphocyte is going to be increased, and the antibody production by the B cells, and this immunocells, because looks like it's a plasmacytes and lymphocytic, let's say, uh, situation or, or thyroiditis is going to develop. And by the end, 
when we do have the cytotoxic effect, usually the apoptosis of thyroid uh, uh, cells and hypothyroidism is going to develop. So that can be the process of the Hashimoto thyroiditis. And relatively, you cannot interfere, you cannot alter the immune system because if you alter the immune system, you are going to alter a lot of other systems as well. So what they do, only they are going to substitute with thyroid hormones and that's it what they apply. Now this is what I mentioned, that's a normal gland. When we do have the action, the inflammation is going on. Important, painless enlargement. So the patient does not show any sensitivity of the gland when we do have this chronic inflammation. And by the end, we do have this fibrosis and shrinking, and that's usually called as a riddle goiter. Riddle goiter when it's going to shrink, and that's the fibrosis completely. We do have another thyroid type of thyroiditis, and that's the postpartum thyroiditis. And that is very similarly to the high, mostly hypothyroidic one, but sometimes can be hyperthyroidic as well. This usually, uh, right after delivery, these symptoms of the thyroid malfunction is going to be seized. However, in some patient, especially if they do present some kind of antibody, anti thyroperoxys antibody or anti thyroglobulin antibody, that's going to progress to Hashimoto thyroiditis and that's be finally an irreversible situation. Yeah, the self-living thing, this is what I already mentioned. It. But they have to be differentiated from the postnatal depression in these patients. Subacute thyroiditis. Now, subacute thyroiditis mostly due to viral infection. Very, sim very uh, important symptoms are fever and painful, let's see, sens sensation of the thyroid gland. It doesn't last longer for a few weeks. This is why it's called the subacute one. And this kind of thyroiditis, initially they do have a hypothyroidism phase after they could have a normal and hypothyroidic phase and finally is going to be healed by the end. So this is the subacute thyroiditis what we deal with. Now this is what I mentioned in the phase. The, the, this disease has uh, four phases. Clinically is presented with a hyperthyroidism initially and euthyroid, hypothyroid and euthyroid by the end. But in anamnesis you always find some kind of sign of viral infection, maybe flu or upper airways infection, and tenderness of the thyroid gland. That's be the leading symptoms of this uh, subacute thyroid. What about the subclinical hypothyroidism? As we mentioned, the subclinical thyroidism especially the primary when we are talking about right now, saying that we do have a normal T3, T4 levels. However, the TSH already elevated. Now, the symptoms may be present or absent. So, if somebody presenting, that's okay. If not, only the general checkup shows that this patient does have a progress of the thyroid diseases, and that can be hypothyroidic at the, by the end. If you look at the incidence of these diseases in worldwide population, it's ranging from 1% to 10%. So 10% is a very huge one. But if you look at, for example, over 60, the women about 25, 21% of the women and 16% of the men affected by this uh, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism. What could be the symptoms or sign of the subclinical hypothyroidism, if there are any? Hyperlipidemia, that can be the leading symptoms. Well, it's not an easy one to decide whether this patient is a primary, let's say, hyperthyroidic patient, or they do have some other as a secondary one. This is why at the first point, if somebody presented as a hyperlipidemia, you have to decide whether they're secondary or primary. Because if it's secondary, you have to treat it as the disease, underlying diseases. In our case, they have to substitute the thyroid hormone. If you substitute the patient, hyperlipidemia disappears. However, if you start treating the patient with an anti-lipidemic drugs, for example, statins, you start to do statins, basically the clinical symptom disappears 
but you are not going to solve the underlying problem. Depression. A lot of cases, depression is behind, let's see, uh, it presented the, the patient as depressed patient. Or gynecologic condition, amenorrhea, for example, or infertility, or, or decreased libido, or tiredness, and other, and a lot of things can be. Uh, cardiovascular symptoms can be the sign of uh, subclinical hypothyroidism such as, for example, that decreases of the systolic and diastolic function of the heart, increases the systolic time interval, or myocardial infarction can present it, or coronary artery diseases, atherosclerosis can develop, LDL cholesterol level can be increased, or hypercholesterolemia can be increased due to subclinical form of hypothyroidism. Now, this is how this disease is going to progress this subclinical form of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, but exactly the opposite way. In a case of, for example, the subclinical form of hypothyroidism, they're saying, okay, it's a normal situation, and years after, when the patient starts to develop this subclinical form, and then other decades, when it's presented as a manifested hypothyroidic patient. So it looks like the subclinical form of hypo or hyperthyroidism on the way to the hypo or the manifested hyperthyroidism. Okay. All right, let's talk about the hyperthyroidism. All right, let's start with a case study. 40-year-old female with onset of symptoms of fatigue, sleep disturbance, palpitation, anxiety, night sweats, sore throat. Two weeks ago, 20 pounds weight loss over, over 10 kilogram loss of uh, over eight weeks with strict diet, which was the first one, diet or some other problem. Physical examination, well, she's still 96 kilograms. Uh, blood pressure, let's see, is normal. Pause is increased, tachycardia. No proptosis, no tremor. Thyroid diffusely enlarged, twice as the normal, firm, tender, free T4, free T3 are elevated. Why? TSH decreased. That meaning that's a primary hyperfunction. Ultrasound showed diffusely enlarged gland with mildly heterogeneous uh, echo structure. No nodules. No. What is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism? Because this patient presents as a primary hyperthyroidic patient. The very common one, that is called the toxic diffuse goiter, or Graves disease, or Graves buzzard of diseases, because in over, these two guys described this, uh, let's see, this uh, hyperthyroidism at the same, ti uh, same time, and overseas they cause Graves diseases, in Europe they cause buzzard of diseases. So, Toxic adenoma as a plumber disease, toxic multinodular goiter as a marine lantar syndrome, subacute thyroiditis, and as I mentioned before, the Hashimoto thyroiditis, and very rare when you can catch, let's see, the hyperthyroid phase, and very rare form, for example, uh, not rare, but it's much rare form, for example, the thyrotoxicosis facilita, when somebody ingesting uh, exogenous thyroid hormone or due to any kind of treatment or weight loss, we want to lose weight. And very rare, another one, for example, the struma ovary, when we do have an HCG stimulate, let's say HCG secreting tumors, or hidden deformed ball, the trophoblastic diseases. So these are, let's see, the most common or rare, but to summarize hyperthyroidism. Let's see the symptoms. Nervousness, tremor, very commonly. As you see, irritability, difficult to sleep, bulging eye, very nice big eye, but not every hyperthyroid is associated. There are two situations. One is called exophthalmus, another one, when it's due to the sympathetic overactivation, usually your eye dip is opening up a little bit. As you are alert, you are watching around. Or menstrual irregularity, for example or uh, frequent bowel movement, diarrhea, very common one. Uh, other one, a deepening of the voice or hoarseness. 
so the tone of the voice changes. Looks like that you got the flu, but not. That's a thyroid hormone. Because what is the effect of the thyroxine if you have too much? It's going to inhibit the relaxation of the muscle. So it's going to be slower. This is why uh, the voice is changing as well when you need to adjust the tone or the, uh, let's say the strength uh, fast. Difficult to swallow. Sometimes it's a mass effect, sometimes it's due to the muscular problem that due to the hyperthyroidism. Uh, Impaired fertility, weight loss, sometimes gain is depending on which phase you are. Heat intolerance, usually they always feel uh, hot and increase the swe uh, increased sweating or paralysis can develop. So that can be the clinical symptoms of the hyperthyroidism. As we said, that the most common one that is called the Graves' diseases. Well, the most common cause of the hyperthyroidism because account about up to 90% of the cases. This kind, this incidence is relatively, it's not too high, because comparing to the whole population, is up to 0.4%. Ophthalmopathy in an advanced form always can be seen, such as exothalmus. And a dermopathy, not generalized myxedema as we saw in hypothyroidism, but a pretibial myxedema occurs only. We don't know why, but possible is due to some kind of uh, immune reaction. So some kind of antigenity of this pretibial area is similar to, let's see, the TSH receptors or something that hell knows why. Family history is very strongly predisposed the patient. Females are five times more involved in these uh, diseases. The peak incidence occurs in girls between 20 and 40, so in your age. And, of course, they are showing some kind of genetic predisposition, age-LA configuration. Symptoms, as we said, typical palpitation, nervousness, hyperkinesia, thyroid enlargement, diffusely enlarged thyroid gland, not nodularly, diffusely. This is due to the stimulation. That's how the TSH effect is not TSH because an antibody is going to stimulate the receptors. Laboratory findings, we do have an increased total T4 and a free T4. The radioactive iodine uptake is increasing due to the TSH effect. Now, this is what they are not going to measure today. This is called the free T4 index. They are not using this one. So you don't need to learn it, so you can omit it. Decrease the TSH because that's the primary. But we do have TSH effect due to the antibody. Okay, so we do have a stimulatory uh, antibody. This is a TRAB antibody. Now, what can be the complication of these Graves' diseases? If any kind of stress occurs, accident, surgery, or what, the thyroid storm can develop, meaning acutely a lot of thyroid hormone dumped into the circulation, and the rapid clinical manifestation of a hyperthyroidism. The patient has, let's see, tachycardia, arrhythmia, uh, heat or heat uh, occupation, fever, very high fever, and arrhythmia, cardiac problem, and the patient can die very easily. So that's a very severe condition. This is why you have to check the thyroid function prior to perform any kind of surgery techniques or anything. Now, this is how an exophthalmos looks like. When the eyeball is pushed out from the socket of the orbit socket, because due to the antibody is going to effect on the retroorbital area, possibly due to the lymphatic circulation, is going to go to the uh, post or, or the orbital area, and the swallowing is going to push out the eyeball. Now that can cause blindness because if you cannot close your eyelid, that's uh, that's either can cause uh, inflammation and. Uh, the scarring of the eye. This is the pretibial myxedema, as you see here, the patient, only in the pretibial area can be seen. Now let's continue our case studies. Uh, differential diagnosis we have to make relatively the subacute thyroiditis or Graves' basis of diseases. Why I was uh, written here the subacute thyroiditis? 
Now, those two things in the anamnestic data that is not going to support grave diseases, such as one, the patient had, let's see, upper airways infection about two weeks ago, and when they evaluated the thyroid gland, that was tender, so it was sensitive. And in graves, it's not sensitive, okay? Now, let's see they measured TSH and free T4. Everything shows it's the primary hyperfunction. However, look at that one. The radioactive iodine uptake is low. In graves based of disease, the radioactive iodine uptake is elevated due to the antibody stimulates the TSH, so we have an overactive TSH effect. And they measured this antibody, and that was negative. So what do you think? What could be the answer here? Subacute thyroiditis, that's it. So very characteristic, no antibody, and the radioactive iodine uptake decreases. Is hyperthyroidism is due to the disruption or the direct stimulation with the, uh, the thyroid gland. Good. Let's see the following 70-year-old male with new onset atria fibrillation. They measure the TSH, that's suppressed, it's lower than normal. Free T4 level is normal range, in the normal range. The radioactive iodine scan, scintillation scan, slightly elevated uptake at 6 and 24 hours, but relatively it's not so advanced. What do you think? What could be the answer here? Don't sleep. That's it? Oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Subclinical hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism. Good. Yeah, you have the answer. I forget it. I should omit the answer from those sheets. And you can write. No, no, no. Well, no. Okay. Now, let's talk about the non-toxic goiter. When we do have the enlargement of the gland only, and the gland is normal functioning. The most common one is iodine deficiency, or it used to be was the most common one, the iodine deficiency. Because if we do not have enough iodine, what will happen? Well, we do have lower level of T4. If we do have less T4, it's not going to feed back the TSH. So the TSH level is going too elevated. So that's going to stimulate the iodine uptake and the size and the vasculature of the thyroid gland. So they are going to hypertrophy, so the goiter is going to develop. Not only this is going to happen, but is the regulatory system is going to increase the T3 that is synthesized or released by the thyroid gland. So relatively, the thyroid gland is pairing iodine and releases more active hormone instead of releasing, let's see, the less active T4. So it's very, very characteristic. Let's see. If you perform and if you measure the radioactive iodine uptake of this patient, what do you think? How is going to be changed? Elevated, not influenced, decreased. A, B, C. Think. Cannot be decreased because we have TSH action. This patient has a very hungry gland. However, there is nothing to eat. There is no iodine. And if you give iodine, for sure, immediately is going to take up. So in this patient, looks like the gland is, has hyperfunction. However, the product is low because you cannot synthesize enough iodinated tyroxine. So in opposite, you will find a decreased T4, but you do have an elevated level of the radioactive iodine uptake, usually that's a leading symptoms of the iodine deficiency. And if you substitute the patient with iodine, everything back to the normal, TSH is going to decrease, radioactive iodine uptake be normalized, everything back to normal. Now today's is very, very rare because they are going to substitute the iodine into the salt, 
or into the bread. So in this population today, this is very, very rare. But as I mentioned, for example, in Hungary, about 60 or 50 years ago, a lot of people had goiter. By the seashore is nothing, but in, in top of the hills, for example, in Himalaya, is still very common one today. Now, goitrogenic diet, brassica, cabbages. Now, this is why we don't like cabbages. Because that's going to alter the iodine uptake. It's going to inhibit the iodine uptake, and some they're going to alter the tyroperoxidase. So if you eat too much, you can suffer iodine deficiency. And goiter can develop. Hashimoto thyroiditis, this is diffusely enlargement, subacute thyroiditis and the tender enlargement, or somebody suffering of the problem with the conversion of T4 to T3 block or congenital receptor, they are very, very rare today. More common one, however, the benign or malignant tumor that you have to differentiate for sure from the iodine deficiency. All right. Now, iodine deficiency, uh, Worldwide is still a very common one. In a population, it takes about 7%. But in Japan, for example, it's zero. But if you go to the Andes or Zaire, it can be about 80% of the population. They do have iodine deficiency. And I think in Europe, we don't have this problem today. So. But you have to exclude if you do have any kind of enlargement. Especially if you do have iodine deficiency, that's be diffusely enlarged. All right? If you have tumor, you do chocolates, all right. And if you do have a nodular increase, that's not iodine deficiency. Uh, however, iodine deficiency can lead to a multinodular toxic goiter. The chance to develop this kind of situation is a higher one. Now, let's see the cancers, the thyroid cancer. That is a very common one today. First of all, if you do have or you do see any kind of nodules in the gland, you immediately you start thinking about whether it is a benign one or that's a malignant one. Looking at the anamnestic data, if the patient is a young guy, mostly that's a malignant one. If it's an old girl, that's mostly benign one. If this nodule, let's see, is firm, very hard, mostly malignant one. If it's a soft, mostly benign one. If you measure the activity, for example, if you measure the T4 level, the serum T4 level, in benign one, usually higher that we do have. So this presented as a hyperfunction. If it's malignant one, usually it's a hypofunction. When a hypofunction, basically, in the serum, it can be normal. However, when you take a scintillation, let's see, counting or a scintillation camera, in benign, you do see hot nodules or warm nodules. Why in malignancy, you do see cold nodules. It doesn't mean that it's cold or hot when you pulp it. It only means that it, cold is not going to take up the iodine, radioactive iodine. If you do have a worm, relatively, this is going to concentrate the radioactivity there. The hot one is very hot spot you're detecting, and it's going to suppress the other gland because we have a lot of hormone released in the system. Now, let's see this. And of course, the free, uh, fine needle aspiration, that's be the um, obligatory to perform. And if you have malignancy, it's malignant. If not, relatively, uh, you are a better situation. Now, look at the most common tumor type or carcinoma, papillary carcinomas, takes about 70% of the case and is presenting between 20 and 40 in the same age when the gray is presenting, but it's relatively is a good survival rate, about 95%. The worst one, when we do have an anaplastic, let's see, tumor, but it doesn't take too much, about 5% of the cases, and usually occurs over age of 60. And the survival rate is very poor. So this is not the best one. But other one, you will learn this one, I think, is pathology very nicely. So you don't need to deal too much about it. Yes. Oh. Don't miss the next lecture. Some ad.
Whoa, 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 whoa! Got a whole other quad to cover. This guy's still got fluid in his lungs. You don't think that's from the... He knows you. What's the problem? Heart attack? Definitely don't know him. The patient's 10. Ten-year-olds do not have heart attacks. It's gotta be a mistake. Right. The simplest explanation is she's a 40-year-old lying about her age. Maybe an actress trying to hang on. He's dictated by motive. Why did he kill his girlfriend? Because he's a maniac. Is that the reason he gave? She was cheating on him. Jealousy. That gets him sent to prison. So don't miss it.